So do you guys see or uh, you don't see the, um, do you see the, um, the, the uh, yeah. yeah, okay. So again, my name is Yahya Ithawi. I'm a consultant neonatologist. And also I am the director of the Arab uh, Board of uh, Neonatology and uh, Perinatal Neonatal Medicine in UAE. And I, I, I really enjoy and love research. And in general, I, I love the unknown and I love creating, not copying the medicine. And the best way to do that is to do research. And, and doing research is, is um, it needs to be very solid so you can publish it in high caliber journals and people uh, start to cite it and use it and make the changes. So we took five sessions before um, about generating the question, reading the article, uh, doing the hypothesis testing, doing the randomization and sampling and so on. And today we will a little, little bit summarize the protocol uh, and we'll talk about protocol because it summarizes whatever we, we talked about. So uh, the objectives of today is to talk about short and long uh, study title, about gathering the authorship and uh, how to create a contact person, writing the uh, abstract and rationale, uh, the study design, the inclusion and exclusion criteria, the primary and secondary outcomes, the sample size and randomization, the process itself of recruitment and enrollment and, and, and patient, patient right is wrong, it, it's a misspell. How to collect the data, analyze it, and then how to present it, patient safety, data safety, adverse event reporting, complaint system, the time frame, and then the references, and the hope at the end we'll do some practice. So um, uh, I'm going to ask questions just to uh, make you engage. What is the difference between short and long titles? Anybody want to volunteer the answer? Dr. Yahya, Dr. Alam Rahmad. Dr. Alam. I think um, short title will be short but informative. A mm -hmm. Long title, as I, I, I think, it is sometimes maybe misleading if not um, um, uh, over uh, words and mm -hmm. not uh, inclusive. The uh, the uh, boycott. Uh, Mm -hmm. as by standard yeah yeah, yeah you're very close um, so the long title is um, the um, title that have the picot that has the details it have the population the intervention the comparison the outcome the time frame and the type of the study well the short title is like a, a portrait it's like a TV uh, title it's like a um, 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 a program uh, title is a kind of attractive and bringing attention. So um, um, I usually have uh, some abbreviation and, and, and um, some naming of the, of the study. So, um, and a long uh, title is a description and most of the ethic board, sometimes they require both, um, especially when you do the submission form, um, uh, when you write an article and wanna submit, usually they ask you to fill a form, which is called the submission form. And they want the both titles. So the short title is, let's say, uh, let's give an example. Uh, uh, you'd want to do study about the relation of uh, car speed and the uh, number of accidents in the city. So you can say the short title, title short title, uh, and the short title will be um, cars does it increase or decrease accident, or car speed does it increase or decrease accidents. While the long title would be um, the um, in a in a in, in city of A does speeding above uh, speed of hundred kilometers per hour in car driven by that person causes um, fatal incidence versus non fatal incidents in compare with the speeding at that level uh, during that period. So that's the long title. And the short title is, is just being, you know, giving some attraction and, and bring the attentions of, of people to the study. So um, the authorship, uh, now there is always talk about who's the first and what does it mean if you are the first person on the, uh, on the authorship list or they are the last person. But this is really depend on uh, the location and where do you live. Uh, for example, in Canada, the, uh, the first 
author is the author of the primary idea and usually, but it's not a must, he's the correspondent. And uh, he also link other authors and uh, 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 summarize different opinions in one opinion. And the, usually the last author is the author that is the most senior and the most influenced and the one whose experience you usually put. And then uh, you put the authors in an order of their uh, involvement in the study. Um, and, and, and when you gather the authorship, remember that you need to have a complete picture. So and a, and a study is, is a picture uh, that has, should have a meaning. Uh, it's composed of different pieces, and these pieces are the authors. So when you gather your authorship, uh, you need to remember that. So you need somebody experienced in, for example, uh, writing on grammars and, and story writing, somebody with more experience in statistics, somebody who is experienced to um, having like managerial skills and, 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 and having a good experience with resources. Other person you might involve because he has previous uh, research and he's a high caliber researcher. So it make easy for the article to be uh, uh, published and so on. So uh, when you create the author, you need to um, remember all of that because it is vital for you to publish it in a good journal is to have a good authorship. Uh, and then you need to um, um, assign rule, uh, uh, rules for each author, what exactly they are doing, because some of the authors, uh, especially the experienced one, they just give you feedback. They look at your study, your design, your writing, your process, uh, your problem, uh, solving conflict, and so on. So each person doesn't mean some people are very involved, others are not as involved as, but uh, some of them are not involved, but they are the key in the uh, article. It's vital to uh, have a good uh, authorship. You gather it in a smart way, um, aiming to publish your articles. And uh, um, remember, uh, some of the authors are uh, published many articles and they are well, well, well known. And when you put their names and it goes to the research engines, um, you can reach to lots of audience and you have lots of citation. So keep that in mind when you start authorship. Um, you can do author, you an, an research on your own for the first and maybe not the second or third. You can probably, you can say that I can, I can uh, 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 write an article and I am the main uh, writer or the main researcher when you at least publish six to seven articles in probably three or four of them are in a high caliber journals. It's vital when you write the protocol to write the authorship and describe exactly the, the rules and what they should do. Um, um, the contact person should be declared very clearly, the name, the title, the contact details, whether it's a email or phone or, or physical location, uh, need to be um, after the authorship. And then you need to write your abstract when you write your protocol. And when you write the abstract to summarize to the, um, because, uh, when you write a protocol, there is a purpose. The purpose of writing protocol might be to get research board uh, approval, or you need to convince your colleagues uh, about your study and start recruiting and they start to help you. And also you can use it for uh, applying for a grant. So it's important to write it in a very smart way uh, to convince other. So the number of words are very vital. When you write the abstract, you need to make a plan whether you will section it. So you will section the abstract to, uh, you know, uh, background, uh, uh, method, uh, result, uh, conclusions, or sometimes you don't need to section it. And remember to put the first uh, uh, about 10 lines uh, about rationality, and rationality mean why you're doing. Uh, three first three lines would be about background, uh, which our what is known or what is written in the literature, and then the three lines of what is the unknown. Uh, what what are you trying to look for, and probably one line to fill the gap between these two areas. You need to write few lines about the method, and few lines what would you expect, what the expected result. Everybody. 
Um, uh, so what is your result? What your expected result? Or if you don't expect it, what you are looking for, what you are hoping to find. Um, and then you need to write a line about conclusion. Now here you might include the hook or the uh, exaggeration or what is next. Um, but usually it's not appropriate to write it in the abstract, but some of the abstracts do write um, a hook in the uh, abstract. You need to write the keywords uh, that you uh, would love the search engines to uh, involve when the uh, people are uh, searching your study. So uh, we started with the title, with the author, and then abstract. Yes, go ahead, please. Just one question. This we, we when we are talking about the study protocol, we are meaning a proposal, a proposal for a study, isn't? Um, it is not a proposal. It is a proposal of a study is uh, um, before the protocol probably. But protocol describes exactly what you are planning to do. Yeah. So the purpose well, of the protocol you. is to convince REP to approve your study, to apply for a grant. And also to convince mm -hmm. colleagues with you that this is your study, this is the way you will do it, and this how they will, and then you need people to convince your study. And then because if, if you don't convince them, if the nurses are not convinced, if the other colleagues are not convinced, they can probably uh, handle your study. Yes, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Another question to you here. I just, uh, this uh, study protocol, we are just preparing the study, not done yet, isn't it? Yes. Okay. Yes. Ah. Uh, uh, here, is not starting. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, uh, I want to just to comment. What about here in one line for conclusion? Expected conclusion will be, isn't it? Yes. Um, yeah, it is the expected yeah. conclusion. Oh, okay. So what what you, will be conclude? What, what exactly so, you want? And, and here sure. when you write it is likelihood. So you think yeah, okay. you will find this sure. or you might find this. Thank you so much. You're most welcome. So um, next in the abstract, you write the um, you write the study method. So and the study method is usually after the introduction. So the study method is you need to really do, uh, write the design of the study. And to write the design, you need to uh, already made a decision of what you are your study. The study design depend on your uh, questions that the PICOT uh, prepared and what you, is your hypothesis, the null and the alternative hypothesis. Also, what is your independent and dependent variables and how you will measure them? How, and how you think that independent variable changes uh, will affect the dependent? If the dependent variables are changed by natural, this is uh, 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 non-experimental. But if you are changing the independent to make effect on the dependent variables, then this is experimental. So, and then, and therefore you will decide, is this ob observational study or interventional study? Is it basic? Is, is you are trying to find the idea? Or you already know the idea, but you want to find the relation between the cause and the, uh, uh, and the result? Is it applied? Is it, again, is it explanatory or exploratory? Is it diagnostic or therapeutic? But sometimes you're not doing, you're doing just chart review or literature review. Or are you looking for risk? Are you going back to look at the risk? It's a retrospective. Or you are starting before the risk. You're monitoring the risk to cause this, the disease. So it's a prospective. Or it's a one time, one shot study is a survey. Uh, or it's a cross-sectional. Is it case control and so on? So it's important before you start your rationale or you start your induction, you need to know exactly your study method. Um, also, you need to make sure that you have the inclusion criteria. Now the inclusion criteria, is it inclusive or exclusive? Which means that, is it all should be included? So let's say if I am inclusion criteria from one four, is the patient, should have all the four inclusion criteria to be recruited, to be interviewed and get consent? Or no, if he has qualified one of these, so it can be inclusive and inclusive. Um, and remember the inclusion criteria will affect your sample size. 
So um, do you need them all together or you need to, um, uh, the patient should be uh, separate. So the patient should be um, uh, meeting the first criteria, then the second, then the third. The inclusion criteria should be very specific. It should not be generalized, okay? And it should be detailed. So you cannot say that um, uh, if you are uh, a Brita, no, you have to say if you are, uh, if your gestational age from this uh, weeks, like let's say 23 plus six weeks um, until you are 33 plus five days and so on. So you need to specify exactly your, your inclusion criteria, your population and, and your criteria. You, you cannot make inclusion criteria a generalization or a general term. You need also to uh, uh, express your exclusion criteria. The exclusion criteria should be detailed and specific. And remember always the, your exclusion criteria, the power of your exclusion criteria, the number will affect the number and the type of bias in your study. And inclusion criteria should be listed and it should not be generalized. It should be very specific. The primary outcome need to be specific, accurate, short, and targeted. So you say that I want a number of the accident, a different type of speed. You don't say uh, um, uh, uh, what the speed in car will do. So you don't do that. You need to be very specific when you write uh, your primary outcome. Now you have secondary outcomes it can be non-specific. It can involve anything others. You can put secondary outcome from one to 100, okay? It can be targeted, but it's not like the primary outcome. It can be uh, uh, not specific as the uh, primary outcome. And now the sample size, we've talked about the sample size, and usually the sample size depend on the previous studies, uh, depend on the confounders, uh, uh, the, uh, when you write the sample size, you don't say approximately or about, you have to give exact number. Uh, now there are different equations depending on the type and design of the study. There is different equation to calculate the sample size. You need to determine your significant level that we talked about, the power of the study, the confidence interval, and then you need the rate. Because remember we said population, targeted population, and then sample size. So the targeted population is the incidence or the rate or the prevalence of that characteristics in the population that you want to study. So you need to mention all that, all the uh, variables that we will, will be in, and of course your standard deviation of course too. And then uh, uh, you need to include all that in when you write your protocol about the sample size and then the exact equation that you use and then you calculate and you give exact number. Of course, you need to mention your concentrate, your loss, sample loss, your, and, and other things that affect that we've discussed when we did the sample size calculation. Now, randomization, and we have just a question about, about uh, the, the uh, one arm or two arm, okay? So uh, when we do randomization, we do it only for probability study, a study that is experimental, a study that is interventional. And uh, the, uh, the sampling, the way we sampling should be mentioned. So is it randomization or it's stratification? And uh, sometimes the randomization, general randomization is, is, is not acceptable. So we do what we call the blocks or randomization. What does that mean? So if you have a hundred patients, okay? and uh, one arm A and 100 arm, arm, uh, arm B. And now you wanna do general random randomization, okay? Remember that it is random. So you might get from the first uh, group, you might get it from zero to 50. And the second, it might get it from 51 to 100. And when you start recruitment, your recruitment might be affected five times. So the first, for example, in winter, different from the second group on summer. And therefore, what you should do, you should make that 100 to groups. 
So 10, 10, and then you do randomization on 10. And therefore, when you do blocks randomization, you prevent the time conflict or the effect of time or the recruitment process on your randomization. The uh, randomization can be quasi or random randomization. It can be non-quasi, which is uh, systemic randomization. You always remember the contamination of your sample when you do randomization. Uh, that's why some people do what we call crossover. So when you randomize uh, arm A and you give the intervention, then you wait for a window, or they call it washing period, and then uh, uh, arm A become arm B and arm B become arm A. Okay, so uh, it can happen, and you ha you have contamination. So let's say uh, you have arm A, you give an intervention and arm B, you give another intervention as a comparison. And then you wanna see what arm B will do if get intervention of arm A and what arm A will do if you get the intervention of arm B. So you switch, you do crossover. But to switch, you need to have a washout period, a window where the consequences of the intervention has disappeared. Um, sometimes that is ethically not possible and sometimes practically not possible. So you need to remember the contamination of your sample size, uh, of your, your of sample, and then the assignment, the concealment, how you did the assignment, how you did the concealment, how you do the grouping, how you do gen the generation, how you are blinding, all this should be mentioned when you do uh, your write your protocol about randomization. Now you need to write the methodology. Methodology mean from the patient meeting your inclusion criteria until you uh, collect the data, apply the statistics test, and get the result. That's called methodology from A to B. So start from recruiting process where the patient uh, meets your inclusion criteria and preclude your exclusion criteria until you start your uh, enrollment which means that your patient is accepting the study and got the, uh, uh, the uh, consent and uh, he or she got the, uh, uh, the intervention. Um, also, you should mention your consent, how you are getting it. Uh, we'll show you an example. Uh, and what is how you get your REP approval? What is your procedure exactly in your data collection, in intervention, in the... Uh, what are the steps you're taking to make your data safe, uh, patient safe, uh, how you're reporting, what you uh, complain process, how you'll do analysis, what the result you're expecting, how you'll present, all you should be written in the methodology. Now, one of the important uh, of doing studies is doing uh, clinical trials is to register it. And the register is will show the uh, journals later on and show the population that there is a start period, there is end period, um, uh, the uh, public know about the study, they can comment on, they can complain. So it is a website where you can register and I will show you an example. You register your study. How you make your data safe? So if it's a physical data like papers, uh, you need to put it in a room with double lock, double door. If it's a software uh, data, you need to have a double password. The data should never leave the institute. You cannot take the data to you to home to do it. And then you should mention how you will get rid of the data and when. Uh, for example, my previous institute, you should destroy the data after 12 years. Uh, if it's a physical, you have to shred it. If it's, uh, uh, if it's a soft data, you need to delete it. You also need to mention who will access the data. And then you make sure that your data, uh, you know, data protocol will not be breached. Um, you need to also write your consent process, your language, how you will get, who will get it, how you make sure that the patient has the right to say no, uh, who get the copies, how you, the patient will sign it, how they will initialize, um, is the uh, the, the, the consent is the same patient, the same subject, or there is a surrogate person who will take a decision of enrollment in the study on behalf of the patient. All this should be mentioned. And also you need the patient safety. Okay, so you need a patient safety committee. 
how your colleagues can report the study if there is a problem. Okay. Uh, who is the team? Who is the team members of your safety committee? How people can reach it? The members. Uh, it's way better that the members should be outside your institute, and it should be more more than one discipline. So a nurse, a physician, a pharmacist, a PR, public relation, and so on. The com the patient safety should give the right for patients to write or to post in the social media about your study. Uh, the patient safety also should have a protocol to terminate the study uh, if um, a, a serious side effect occurs and so on. So all this should be in the protocol before you start your study. How people can uh, report or complain about your system to you or to REP, because you have two different complaints. Uh, what are the emails or the phone numbers, the name, the process, the physical locations of the people that patient and other people who is looking at your study and seeing your study can report the study. You need to write about funding. Who is the organization who's funding you? How are you gonna manage it? Where the money will be saved? What is the materials you're gonna buy? Uh, are you giving salaries for research assistance? You need a clear documentation and it should be always, uh, uh, you should be always ready for audit. Uh, from audit organization when you do have the money to fund your research. Uh, now, in the study, you need also to write your references. Uh, what is the uh, style, the type of references accepted by REP? And this style depends on the REP and the journals. Uh, you need to make sure about falsifications uh, and uh, attributing a text to a reference, and it's not uh, plagiarism and the percentage of plagiarism that that REP will accept because, for example, in Canada, we accept, they accept 5% of uh, uh, plagiarism and uh, each statement is uh, of five consequent, uh, uh, consecutive words. They call it copy and paste. Uh, in the, when you write the reference, um, it's important to write about the grammar and spelling check, your punctuation, your tenses, uh, your uh, uh, complex versus simple, simple uh, sentences when you reference. And remember, referencing, when you reference in the, in the introduction, it doesn't mean you copy. So uh, having the reference number and name, it doesn't mean that you copy and paste. You have to read the article of that reference and you have to phrase it in your own words and then reference it. So references is different from quoting or citing from the, if you wanna cite, there is a process for quote and cite. You cannot write, so you have to put it in a certain way so people know that is not, this is not you, this is the, the other research or the reference are talking. It's different from referencing. So these are my references when I've uh, done this. And um, I'm gonna show you some examples of, uh, I'm done with the, with, the, with the writing protocol, but I'm gonna show you some example of protocol. Um, just to give you an example, um, I wanna show you the protocol itself. I wanna show you the consent, I wanna show you the uh, clinicaltrial.gov. So um, uh, let me share with you. Um, so let's share. Do you guys see this now, the website? Do you guys see the website? No. no. You don't see the clinicaltrial.gov? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's clear. No, not, not yet. Oh, is clinical it? trial. Yes, I saw. I, I can see. Yes, yes, I see. Clinical trial registry of uh, of the uh, United States National Library, and you can see that this is one of my studies that I've registered, and so you can see the title. Okay, and you can see the start, and uh, the last update and the finishing date. So the start date, the finishing date, the last update. Okay, you can see the sponsor of the study, you can see the name of the person, you can see the description of the study, uh, you can see the uh, study design, you can see the arms and the intervention, is it one or two arms? Okay, you can see this study is two arms, you can see the outcomes, the secondary outcomes, you can see all the details, you can see how many are secondary outcomes, there are many. Uh, you can see eligibility criteria, and you can see a contact, a location of the study, and you can see the details of, so 
and you can see there is phone numbers and there is email people can uh, you can see the abbreviation and so on and you can see people can report the study and you can see the uh, study will have a number so um, I, I think the number will be here you can see the number of the study so if you click that number uh, reference to that number and that's called the identifier or the number and you can see uh, you have the history of change if the people are changing the protocol and so on. So this is vital when you do a randomized study to register it. Now there are many registry, not only this one, but this is an example. Now I want to show you a different thing. I want to show you um, a consent form. Excuse me? Yes, go ahead. Uh, I'm Dr. Sanders. Marhaba, tafadali. Alan, excuse me, I didn't see the screen. You didn't see the screen? No. Um, well, everybody saw it, which means that you have a, a local problem. But I, I, can, I, I can share it with you later on. Okay, thank you. Do you now see the consent form? Only the slides. You only see the slide. Anybody else see the slide only? Yeah, consent form available, I can see. Yes, I, I see also the consent form. You see the consent form, right? Yes. Okay, so you yes. can see the consent form, and you can see the title and also the uh, um, holding organization where the study will be done. You can see there is introduction uh, in Arabic and in English in two languages, and you can see the purpose of the study, okay, and how you participate in the study. And you can see the risk of and discomfort. You can see the benefit of the study. You can see the cost of the study on patient. You can see the alternative if the patient refused the study. You can see something about confidentiality. And what is the information that will be collected from patient data? Um, and there is an, 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 an indication of the voluntary uh, nature of the study. And also you can see that some text about if a uh, uh, a side effect or a damage or injury happened to the patient um, and if the patient has the right to um, have a question and there is a phone number and probably email to um, contact the person you can see the subject code or subject id and you can see the statement of the consent the agreement and you can see it's in arabic there is you know the name of the person uh, of the participant or the surrogate uh, the print of the patient, and also a statement of the person who's taking the consent and his name and so on. Um, so this is an example of a consent form. And this one is need to be written before the study and the REP should approve it before you use it. I'm going to show you something else. I'm going to show you the protocol itself. Do you guys see protocol now? Hello? Do you guys see the protocol? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. yes. So this, yes is an, no, I, I this is an example of a protocol. We've, we're, we're done. We are using point of care ultrasound to measure the bowel wall thickness uh, with different gestational and postnatal ages. And you can see the main author and you know the rest of the team are involved and you can see probably my name is there and you can see the the, the you know the certificates and also the titles and you can see the correspondence you can see the introduction there is no abstract here um, because REB here does not need um, you can see um, details and referencing um, and the referencing you can see the objective of the study the study design you can see the sample size calculation uh, you can see so there is exact number you can see the primary outcomes, secondary outcomes. You can see the inclusion criteria, exclusion criteria. You can see the method, the methodology. Um, you know, we're, we're trying to correct, of course, uh, by track chain format. You can see the funding also mentioned here, and you can see the references. <coughs> okay, although this is, was not final, but uh, this is an example of a protocol. Yes, any question? Uh, is this the uh, same as proposal in, 
Uh, proposal is uh, before the proposal is is before the uh, protocol. The protocol, the proposal. You can see it's the same. Probably it's the same. But the protocol is the process. Proposal is the idea. The proposal probably is the rationale why you wanted the study. But the uh, the protocol is a description of exactly what you will do from start until you're publishing your data. That is the protocol. And the purpose I mean, of the protocol is to get REP approval, to get fund, and to convince your colleagues to participate in the study. Yes. Uh, I mean, this one, uh, the protocol should be written after the approval or before the approval? Before the approval. This is the first thing you do in the study. This is the first thing you do in your study. So the protocol should be combined with the uh, consent form, the data collection sheet, the patient safety committee sheet, the data safety sheet, your certificates, and your ethic board uh, course, and then all of that submitted to the REP, so the REP can give you the green light to start the study. I mean, so no need for proposal. No, you did not mention proposal. Proposal is uh, before you start the study. So I will write a proposal to convince you and other people to join me. So if I want to do a study more than one center, I, I write a proposal and okay. convince everybody to start the study. But after everybody is convinced, I need to write a protocol. A protocol, not a proposal. It describes exactly in details what is the study and how you will start from A to Z. Okay, clear. Shukran. Rehal, I want to question you, please, Dr. Allah. Ah, Mr. Allah, please. I get disconnected with you, Alam. I don't hear you. Yeah, yeah. I after this this protocol before the study, but but after finishing the study according to my result, I will reshape my abstract my uh, conclusion after, everything Alan, after you you have to write the manuscript and the manuscript yeah. is totally different from the protocol although you can share mm. you can use some of the data but it's different so the introduction probably mm. same but you have to change the tenses sure. yeah but yeah some of them the methodology probably mm. use same but mm. Uh, mm. for the result you were talking about the hope the purpose, mm. but now in the manuscript you're talking about uh, the facts. You get the, you yeah. know, and now you have, yeah. you have the facts. And also you start to talk about discussion. Okay, and then uh, yeah. that is the sure. manuscript. So protocol sure. is the text, of the document before start, and the manuscript is the document after you, uh, you have done your study. Oh, no, very nice, thank you so much. Uh, often, the uh, Korea Municipal uh, Safety, it is yeah, in each institution, the safety. Um, I got disconnected. I didn't hear the whole question. Uh, uh, for the safety of uh, yeah, uh, patient safety uh, committee or yeah. data safety committee. Uh, it is yeah, uh, the, the uh, in each institution, there is a safety uh, unit. No, no, there, there is no safety. You have to create. You ah. have to create it. But most okay. of the REP will not give you uh, any, uh, permission. You will not get the R approval without patient safety. So if an injury happened to the patient, how are they going to, uh, if there is adverse event happen, how are you going to report it? Who will report it? If there is a deviation or a detour from protocol, how you will do it, how you report it. And uh, the, after you report it, when an injury happened to your patient, how the patient will be managed? Who will pay for the management? Okay, and what is the patient right in that period? You know, can the patient waive the, the right to uh, complain about that injury because they signed or not? So that's called, that's dealt why by patient safety committee. The patient safety committee should be a members outside the research group and it's the best to be outside your institute and to be more than one discipline 
to cover all the aspect of complaints. So because the complaint might be a science, might be a problem in your research, but it might be, no, there is no problem, but the process, the conducting of research has a problem, okay? Or the attitude of the researchers, or, you know, maybe people will see that the researcher have uh, violating patient rights. All that's called patient safety. There is other thing called data safety. So who access the data? Where the data will be saved? People, for example, I'm gonna tell you an example. Now, in a, in a community who is very uh, restrict uh, uh, and you're doing echo uh, to find the congenital heart problem. And uh, it happened that the patient is a female. So if people knows that this patient have a ASD, but the pop for the public is a congenital, it might affect her future getting married for them. So who's getting the, um, the data? to the patient, how you will manage the data, who is exposed, who will manage the data, how the patient has the right to have the personal information protected, and what is the personal information act that protecting patient rights. All this should be in the data safety committee. What is the procedure? And if the data uh, uh, safety is breached, who will report and how they will report. So that's called safety committee. Okay, thank you. Shukran. Okay. Any more questions? I think today is the lecture is a little bit not hard, not as tough as other, um, you know, about tests and, and terms and, and um, difficult science. Today is about like summary of, uh, you know, the previous sessions. Hello? Any questions on the previous sessions you can ask too. Okay, Yes. Uh, I have a question that uh, after writing a protocol, can I change uh, in any area of study? It depends on the type of the study. Remember? Remember we've talked about if it's, uh, explore, if, if it's exploratory, then okay. Uh, if it's a basic, if it's nanoprobability, then you can change it. Because okay. it also it depends on the variables. If the variables are numbers, you cannot change it. Okay? But if it's about emotion, about uh, status, about assessment, about perception, you can change it. If, uh, it's better not to change, but it depends on the type of the study. So if it's a probability study, you should never change. If you change, then okay. it's a new But if it's not a probability study, you are not inferring to a big sample size. Not you're not inferring. You're not doing a test. You're not doing randomization. There is only observation, or it's only basic, or it's only start. It just you want to know the known, the unknown. Then you probably can change it with time. Especially, for example, if you're doing a study and you don't know the incidence of targeted population in the population, because you're sampling the targeted population. If you don't know the incidence, then because you're doing a study, you will know the incidence and the prevalence. And by then you can change because you can say, no, this sample size is not enough. I think the, the incidence is high, so you need to recalculate. That's okay. only possible when it's not a probability. Okay. Uh, if, I, if I have a clinical trial and I want to register it <clears throat> in one of the websites that you have mentioned, yeah. uh, what is the benefit? for uh, registering uh, uh, my clinical trial in this website? The benefits are many ways. First, the REP will not give you an approval without registering your trial, one. Second, okay. many journals will not accept your publication without registering. Third, uh, 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 people in the study can complain. If something very serious in the study, or if you deter from your protocol, because deter from protocol can change the result. So people can fake. Um, so registering is a, is a third party that is controlling that you really stick to your protocol. You're not saying a protocol, but giving another result, not related to your protocol. Um, and most of the time, uh, these registry have a local representative 
So for example, clinicaltrial.gov have a representative and mostly it's universities. So they should have a representative and they're giving you, they're giving them an organization license. And this organization license will give you your personal license because only one person can change the protocol. Once you change the write the protocol, there is a group of auditors who will review your protocol. And if it's not following the standard of, of uh, randomized control trial or a trial, they will not give, they will not kick it off. They will not give you the permission to be online until you change uh, the protocol in a way uh, that suits the standard of trials. Once you have it, you have to put the number in your protocol before you're getting REP approval. Because uh, one of the mandate of REP approval is to have a, a number in a clinical trial, .go, in a clinical trial uh, registry system. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so I have a question from Nibal, difference between primary and secondary outcome. The primary outcome is the outcome that you're looking. The outcome, uh, REP is a research ethic board. REP is a research ethic board. Uh, so the primary outcome is the, your main outcome, is your target. But just in, happen that there might be second other outcomes, just in case. Oh, I mean, so the other outcomes, there, it is an outcome, but it's not the purpose of your study. You just mentioned. Quasi is a randomized control trial. It's a probability sampling. It's a random randomization. Uh, Nanequasi is, is, is randomized, but it's not random randomization. It can be systemic randomization, cluster randomization, or stratified randomization. But Quasi is random randomization. And also in Quasi, there might be a, a contamination. Uh, there might be a crossover from one arm to another arm. So first arm you give, then you give a washout period, and then same arm will be giving the other intervention, and the other arm will give you the other intervention. Um, so that's called quasi. And so quasi is random randomization. Assalamu alaikum. Alaykum assalam wa rahmatullah. I am uh, Dr. Maher. Ahlan wa uh, sahlan. I just uh, have a question uh, from previous uh, lecture. Go ahead. Uh, for B value, okay. Uh, so, uh, when we review any study, there is uh, uh, B value. Uh, B value in in all of the most of the schedule, there is B value, like in the mm -hmm. statistical uh, mm -hmm. uh, or independent variables. For example, when they review the uh, age or uh, there is B value in front of each one. Correct. Sometimes it is significant, and sometimes we find it it is insignificant. Come on. Okay. The question is. So why, yani, why the calculate, yani, why it it is, yani, sometimes, yani, why it is, yani, there is different between. Okay. So sometimes you, you observe a difference. Me. You observe a difference in your study. Okay, so you're having one arm A and arm B, and you see a difference between them. But is that difference statistically correct? Because when you see it, it's anecdotal. You just see it. It can be subjective. But it's really there when I applied statistic to it. So that's called statistical test. Now, statistical test uh, depend on the null hypothesis. And the null hypothesis depend on what you are applying for. Are you applying it for sample size or are you applying it for a statistical test? And what is that statistical test? And this depends on the study design and the type of the variables. The significance as simple as is, sometimes there is a difference, you see it, but it's due to chance. Okay? Yes, Dr. Yahya, it is, it is, you are talking about the outcome. Yeah, for example, uh, 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 there is difference between this group and this group. Mm -hmm. In the uh, yeah, for uh, using CBAP or surfactant, uh, okay, yeah, which is yeah, this there is difference or no difference. Okay, 
But I mean, if we يعني, uh, go back to the statistic uh, characteristic, I mean, of mm-hmm. this patient. So let me finish to you and tell me what is significant. Uh, You're asking about significance, right? Yes. Yeah. So the significance, as I told you, significance can be applied in different areas. Can be applied to sampling. It can be applied to statistical testing. Both okay. of situations, it depends on null hypothesis. Null hypothesis is basically saying, I don't know. There is difference or there is no difference. That's okay. null hypothesis. Now, in your, when you do your statistics, you will either approve it or reject it, the null hypothesis. So if you approve it, then mean there is difference. If you reject it, that means, uh, if you approve it, there mean no difference because it's null. Mm-hmm. If you yes. disapprove it, then you accept the alternative hypothesis, then means there is a difference. Okay? Yes. Now, when you do that, there should be a cut. Like, let's say you're doing a blood picture. You are doing complete blood picture, okay? And you're looking to hemoglobin. How do you say this hemoglobin is normal? You have a number. You should have a cut. So, as we said, there is a difference, but is it statistically different or not? To be statistical difference, there should be a cut between there is a difference or there is no difference. So significance mean uh, if you have a, a dice, you have the index R, and that yes. dice is 20 faces, what is the chance that you will get number 11? So if you throw the dice and you have 20 faces from 1 to 20, what is the it's chance five. that you get number 11? One of 20. Uh, One of 20. So it's 5%. Why are you getting this? It is due to chance. It's 20 due to chance, yes. It's due to chance. But if you get the number 11 twice, which means 10, 2 in 20, which means 10%, that means this is not a due chance. That is the significance. So in 5%, despite there is difference, despite the difference is there, but we do not take it because we think this is due to chance. So we reject the null hypothesis in that area. And we accept the alternate hypothesis, mean there is difference. So it's significant. The lowest the chance, the more the strong the study, but it will be a bigger sample size. That is called alpha error. The significance called alpha error, which means there is difference, okay? But we do mm-hmm. not take it. So it is false, Positive. It is positive, but we don't take it. Okay. That is the significance. It is an area where null hypothesis is rejected. But it is rejected because it's due to chance. So there is a difference, we do not take it. And because it's a null hypothesis, and we we accept that there is difference, and the null hypothesis said there is no difference. So that's the significance. And it's always 5% because, why 5%? Because we think that one in 20 chance is fair. One in 10 is not fair. One in 100 is too much extreme. Yeah. Because yeah. More, the more you put the, 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 you know, the, the last the chance, the more you need a sample size. Yes. And if you say the chance is zero, that means you are not sampling. You are taking the whole population and it's impossible. Yes. Okay, so the significance mean w- the, the rejecting or accepting the null hypothesis. And then remember, the null hypothesis says, I don't know. So if you accept the null hypothesis, okay, you know that there is no difference. If you reject it, you know there is a difference. So null yes. hypothesis said there is no difference. But in that 5%, there is a difference. But we yeah. accept it. And that's why we accept the alternate hypothesis and it's significant and the less the more statistical significance now this can be applied to sampling but also it can be applied to statistics how we get the numbers because when we say one person there is a number and this the number can get it from tables so we can use it without numbers so it's called probability or we can take it with numbers it's called z scoring a standardized numbers I don't know if I explained it in a correct way, but you need to yes. practice it 
And it, it's not difficult to understand. I know it's difficult from beginning, but once you practice it, it becomes not difficult. Mm. Shukran. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hisham. Any more questions? I have a long uh, text from Hisham. Hi, everyone. I'm Hisham Zdin. Thank you, Dr. Hisham. My question is that KA, KAP type knowledge, attitude, and practice of research can be considered as a qualitative data type or can be also, yeah, it can be both. It's more look like this study is uh, qualitative, not quantitative. It can be mostly qualitative, but it depends on, because when you say uh, uh, attitude or practice, uh, you have to determine your measures. And your measures determine is it quantitative or qualitative. So if you measure, for example, the, the number of conflict happened between the researcher and the patient, this has become qualitative. But if you wanna measure the attitude of the researcher toward the research or toward the patient and you score them, this is qualitative. Uh, so the quantitative and qualitative type depend on your measures and the measures is subjective. Remember if we talked about variables, uh, the selection of variables are depend on subjectivity first and depend on the previous uh, experience. Uh, why we think, for example, um, somebody who has a scarf, yani muhajjar, is the normal in a population. That's the standard. But if you go to another population, that would be weird for a female to put. Okay? So why we select hijab? Because that is the experience. That is the normal. That is the previous experience, that is the previous studies. But also you can use the variables depend on your experience, on your subjectivity, okay? Uh, we look at uh, a scene and I think the scene is beautiful. You think it's not beautiful. So there is subjectivity when we measure things. So variables are subjective and depend on previous experience. The qualitative or quantitative depend on the measure. And the measure depend on the variable you select. So this can be qualitative, can be quantitative. Is, I mean, the measurement of attitude and practice or knowledge of practice or knowing of practice uh, when dealing with patient um, or the attitude of patient, uh, the, the researcher toward the patient. Any more questions? Well, thank you very much. I hope you uh, got some benefit from the study. Eid uh, Kumbarak, inshallah. I think the Eid is here today after the Fajr. And Allah will be pleased. And we'll see you, inshallah, in the next session.